This is the Redemption Church Podcast with Pastor Daniel Williams. We are studying the book of Ephesians in a series called Jesus Says. We hope you are encouraged and blessed by this message. Hey, I have a question for you. Have you ever wondered why you're here? Sorry to get all serious and stuff, but like the purpose of life, has that ever boggled your mind before? Have you ever thought, oh crap, I'm a little person in a big world. What am I supposed to do with my life? Um, if so, I'm glad that you're here. Because Paul actually addresses this. He was just another guy that really in history was just a man. Lived just a normal life. Got changed by Jesus. Did some amazing things. And because, well, because he found God, his whole life has changed. And that's the really cool thing about the redeeming grace of God is when you find Jesus, your whole life changes. And Paul's been writing in the book of Ephesians for the last three chapters, the last couple of months we've been studying, all about God. And he's addressing why we are here on earth. Because it's all about God. It's all about Jesus. Jesus has been said He came down from heaven to manifest the Lord, to show you who God was in His character and His soul, and to let you know that there is actually a purpose for your life. That there is a way, that there is redemption, that there is hope. So Paul's been preaching to us a lot just about who God is, about what He's supposed to do, um, who, who, what the gospel is, who, who, who God is. And Paul is trying to make this connection between God and your life. And sometimes, just to be honest, sometimes that connection can be really hard. Because we get so caught up in the world and so caught up doing, doing, doing and purpose and wanting to make an impact, we forget that the only way we're going to make impact, true, genuine fruit, Jesus says, is abiding in Him and knowing Him. So, Jesus wants to be the purpose of your life. He says, come, follow me. I'll I'll make you a fisherman. I'll change. I'll give you some hope. I'll give you a future. I'll give you a plan. And it will be something greater than you could ever ask or imagine. Something you can't even ponder, can't even think. And you're going to have to literally give up your purpose and follow me. And that's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to follow God, is to actually know who God is. Not only a Savior, someone that takes away the sin that you have, that forgives you, that redeems that relationship, but also this, and it's sometimes a hard pill to swallow, that Jesus is Lord. Right? Because a lot of people talk about Jesus as Savior. Because He is. He died on the cross for our sins. He has forgiven us. He is an amazing, gracious, incredible God. But here's the uncomfortable part in the book of the letter that switches for Paul. He's been talking all about God. And this is pretty awesome because God's perfect. But now he's about to flip it and he's about to talk about us. And he's about to say, okay, now in light of all this, what are we going to do? And a lot of people love studying about Jesus or God or religion or these things, but then they don't actually apply it to their lives. And, and the Word of God would warn us against about this about us. He says, but be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. I wrote, we sure love to listen and put the weight of God's sovereignty on, but we need to also remember that there's human responsibility called faith. And God works with both sides. Sometimes it's, it's easy to just talk about God, talk about God, talk about God, and just, hey, you know, just, it's God, it's God, it's God. But there is an aspect of faith that we need to embrace, trusting who God is to affect our everyday life. For example, when we've talked about this, Paul addresses in chapter 1 about, you know, sovereignty of God, human responsibility. He, he says, you know, God gives grace, but we have to receive it. God saves people but He calls us to preach. God builds the church and and really redeems people, but He calls us to make disciples and to minister and to serve. God is God, and we actually have to let Him be God in our lives. Too many people, especially followers of Jesus, blame God for their own lack of faith in their life. They blame God for their lack of obedience and distrust because they see a perfect God and they don't apply it to their lives. Galatians would say this, do not be deceived. Again, deception. We need to make sure we're renewing our minds by the way we think about what we're to do with God and who He is. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will also reap. For the one who sows is his own flesh, will from that flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. God allows us to choose to follow Him. And we have a role to play in this. 
And sometimes that's, I don't know about you, but that's sort of like daunting. That's like, oh man, I wish it was all about God because I know that I'm going to blow it. I'm going to mess up. But the reason why Jesus wants us to do this and to follow Him and to make this decision is because He wants the best thing for us. He wants us to experience His faithfulness and His Word and the power of His Spirit in our lives. And He says in John 13, 17, if you know these things, well, blessed are you if you do them. So Paul is now really shifting in this book to application. He wants Jesus to speak into our life and to give Him purpose. And the question we have to ask ourselves now in these next couple of weeks is Jesus really our Lord? Now, I don't want to question your salvation. I just want you to know, like, Lord, that implies like master slave. That implies like obedience. That implies faith. That implies doing what God says. Do you do what God says? Because if you do, did you know that Jesus wants that for you? Because it's the best thing for your life. For we were His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for His good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God, I want to let you know, He has teed you up with an amazing plan, an amazing purpose, something that right now you may not even dream about, but God has already placed it in history to, for you to walk in. The question is, will you walk in light of that? Will you actually go down deep and remember these things? And these things can be hard to apply. But this is like really where the action's at, the glory is at, the incredible, amazing grace of God is at, that we would be able to walk in tune with who God is and do amazing things. Two, a few weeks ago, my wife and I were recently watching um, a movie, Selma. It's about Martin Luther King Jr. I don't know if you know him. Um, he's a really famous man. He has a holiday. You should get to know some history. Um, but man, it just like pumped me up because I think we look back on history and we look at people like Paul and we're like, oh my gosh, look at it. we're still studying writings of Paul. Or we even look at like modern day history and like Martin Luther King, we are literally, um, blacks, Selma was all about a movie how blacks had the right to vote and they were protesting, doing these things for that cause. And we just, we hype up the glory and we forget, oh, but it's, that was really hard. Like Martin Luther got shot and killed and assassinated, and there was death threats, and he, there was people that were being beaten and persecuted just to get this right, just to do what God was telling them to do. You have even people of the faith like Hudson Taylor, pioneering missionary, going into China where literally missionaries would pack all their stuff in a body coffin because that's pretty much how they would come back home. But yet we forget about all that hard work. We forget about all that faith that people have and we just put it all on God. But the reality is God works with His plan for your life. And He wants to do great things, but He wants to use, do great things through us, through His people. And we applaud the legends, don't we? We're like, oh my gosh, that's so great. But we boo the reality of walking in that faith with our own lives. Doing the hard thing. So, what I want us to ponder these next two weeks in this shift of book is this. I'm calling this message, Walk Worthy of Your Calling. It's part one of part two. We're not going to finish all 16 verses, but we're going to be in chapter 4, verse 1 through 16. And some questions I want us to ponder and really pray about, because I believe that God still is alive, that He still uses people like us, that people like Martin Luther King Jr., Hudson Taylor, or Charles Spurgeon, or people like Paul were just regular men. Even the book of... Uh, James, Elijah, it says, was a man just like you and I. The Bible encourages us and lets us know that these are just people of faith that trust Him, that get amazing results. And you could read about people of faith, like Hebrews 11 talks all about that. And that calling, that plan, that purpose, that generation from generation of God's faithfulness is still here today. We serve an amazing, incredible God. And He has called us to do some incredible, amazing things. And the Bible tells us that we are to walk worthy of the calling that God has placed before our paths. To work with what we got, that we've been appointed at such a time as this, in this generation, God knows everything about you and your imperfections, and He still wants to use you. And He still calls you to walk by faith, to trust in Him. Don't give up. Some questions to ponder in this next section of Scripture as we study together. What are we going to do now with the information we've been studying about God?
Have you ever asked that question? I pray you do. I pray that when you're reading God's Word, you ask that question. Well, what, what, do, what do I do now? God, in light of your beauty, in light of your grace, in light of that verse, how do I apply that to my life? What would it look like if I took God seriously? Not if my friend took God seriously, or my kids, or my cousins, or that church, or this. What if, personally, what if I took God seriously at His Word? What does that look like for my life? If I went just full of faith, if I just went for it. You ever ask these questions? What, is it, what does your life look like if you actually took God's Word and His promises and just went for it? If you took the responsibility in your part with faith and applied His words, what does that look like for you? So, this is where we're at in the book. Because Jesus has the right not only to say who God is, but Jesus has the right to say what you are to do with your life if you're a follower of Him. Because He bought you with His blood. He bought you with a price. He died for, for you and for I. He didn't have to die. He was God, but He came a lowly servant, humbled Himself, so that way He can redeem a people to actually do great things for Him. And we're going to get into that. And we're going to talk about this calling and the joy of a calling to just follow God not only about the study of God's Word, of who God is, but to have Jesus just, man, to, all right, Jesus, you said do this, I'm just going to do it. And the freedom that that entails. Because I think there's a lot of fear, and there's a lot of, um, well, just disillusion, just discontentment, because we rely on ourselves to do this amazing stuff. But here's the thing. All we need is faith. All we need to do, really, is just go back to God and what He says. To go back to God and just to worship Him. To continually do that. And He gives us the strength through the power of His Spirit. He gives us the calling. He gives us the gifts. He just he aces it for us. He just says, just, just do this and you'll be blessed. And we really will be. So this week in this section, I want to focus on how God has called, gifted, and empowered His church to walk in a manner worthy of their calling. Next week, I'm going to focus really on talk about and finish up this section about how our calling as God's people, as church, well, they need, it needs to be saturated in love. It needs to be saturated in love. So, our calling, our gifting, our empowerment, what does that even look like? What is Paul telling us through the Scripture? Let's read it. Let's pray. Let's study it together. We're going to read all 16 verses to get the whole context. We'll uh, go through, Lord willing, verse 11. And then next week we'll finish the, the thought of, wow, we have a calling. We could walk in it and we should do it with love. Pretty awesome. This is Paul writing. He says, I therefore, now remember if, why we read a therefore, it's, we're reading it, what is it there for? It's the last three chapters all about God. And he says, well, because of all this stuff about God and how amazing he is, I am a prisoner for the Lord. And I urge you, I beseech you, I beg you to walk worthy in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now there is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord and one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it said, when He ascended on high, He led a host of captives and He gave gifts to men. In saying He ascended, what does it mean but that He had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that He might fulfill all things. Verse 11, And He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. For building up the body of Christ until we all obtain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carrying about every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, 
into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's, uh, let's pray and let's dig in. Jesus, we thank you so much, God, that you have an amazing calling for our lives, Lord, that you use imperfect people like us. God, you want to bless us. You are the giver of all good gifts. And Lord, you give those gifts liberally by your grace. And we're just so grateful for the gift of salvation, for the gift of your word, the gift of being able to get together to study your word. Lord, we ask, Father, that you would speak through your spirit that you would reveal these things to our hearts. God, that we would see the joy of the path, Lord. Like Psalm 1611 says, that there is joy at your your side, Lord, doing your will, your presence, God. So we just want to know your will. We want to do it. We want to walk in your ways, Lord. May we fall more in love with you, God. May we have confidence in your word. Because some of us, we just... We don't see it. We don't want to be used by you because we know of our imperfections. And Lord, I pray you just restore us. That you'd build us up through your word. That you would encourage us. Allowing us to see your beauty and your wisdom of how you work this mystery of the gospel. How you save us from our sin, but yet you, you also give us the purpose to do amazing things by your grace. So Lord, may we walk worthy in a manner that you call us to. May you speak to your people today. May you give them application and words and things that they can look out for and identify and walk in your path this week, Lord. Lord, we thank you that we can rely on you, that we can trust in your name. God, I thank you that you know every single person here, how you brought them here, and you want to minister to them. So encourage them, God. Build them up. Lord, it's for your glory that we gather here today. So may you be glorified in the teaching of your word, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, all right. You guys are taking notes now. Thank you, Ronnie. Appreciate it. That's good. If you want to bust out your phone and tweet it for later, that's great too as well. Uh, The first thing I want you to see is this in in numero uno. uh, Point number one, God has called you the church. God has called you. Remember, Paul is talking to saints, to believers, to Christians, people that put their faith in God, and he calls you people, imperfect people, People like you and like I, his church. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, in verse 1, urge you to walk worthy in a manner of the calling to which you have been called. We have been called to do ministry together. Now, remember, Paul's building on stuff he's already said. He wants to make a case that we've all been called. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you ever felt left out before? Like you're not worthy, like there's a little circle and you go in and you can't like, oh, hey, oh yeah, I remember that movie, but oh, and then it's just like, it's just like, ah, oh, I'm not a part of it. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. God's grace is for everyone. You, you can have, this is, this is all inclusive, man. You get everything, all spiritual blessings are in Jesus. You get to do some work. You get to be fulfilled. You get to experience God's grace because it's by grace that we've been saved. That way no one can boast. Didn't we remember that in verse 2? or chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, um, Paul says, listen, the God's grace, man, he, he wants to use saints. He brings the, the, them into his kingdom. He makes them born again, and we're all made new on, uh, in the path of the cross, that we need Jesus. And the gospel has the power to free us from sin, but the gospel has the power to use anyone, to bring purpose to anyone's life. And so much so, Paul said, now I, here is my purpose. This is what God's bringing me through right now. I'm a prisoner. Remember, because we look at like the big part of like Paul the Apostle, and he was a church planner, and he did all this great stuff. This is the second or the third time he identifies himself as a prisoner. In chapter 3, when it starts out, he says, I'm a prisoner as well. He continues to go back and to make sure people know that his calling is from the Lord, and even if God puts him in prison, it is of God's will and for a plan and for a purpose. And he says, I, a prisoner for the Lord, I have a part of this to play. My life isn't perfect. It's sort of hard following God, but I'm not giving up. And guess what? You get a piece of this too. And maybe God has called you to suffer, or called you to do the right thing, or called you to give in that way. Whatever it may be, walk worthy in this manner. Imitate me as I follow Christ, Paul would say. And God 
wants to use us, all of us, his church, just like Paul and his church, to glorify God and to make disciples. And God is able to use imperfect people like me and like you. Okay? And this is for his glory. This is for his good. This is part of the mystery of the gospel. In chapter 3, verse 10, it said, Now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Did you know that our imperfect lives highlight God's amazing wisdom? He doesn't condone sin, evil, imperfection. But angels are marveled that the gospel is preached to men. That God allows people to just choose to walk in his path. It says that we now, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. His people. And we are to walk worthy because of God's grace. God's grace is not just something that saves us. It's something that sustains us through our Christian walk. That's why we take communion to make sure our, our minds are right, that we're focusing on God's grace and His glory and His goodness because His church is all about Him. He is Lord. He is worthy to do things. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, verse 22, Paul said, The church, which is the body, the fullness of Him who fulfills, who fills all in all. That the Lord has given us His Spirit as His church to be His hands and His feet, to represent Him, to do His will on earth as it is uh, in heaven. That he would, his kingdom would come, that, he, that we would know the living and true God and he would direct his people to walk in the path of righteousness. That God's spirit would live in his people and work through us. And this is an incredible thing. Especially as Paul was breaking down the separation between Jew and Gentile and, and the temple and where the spirit lived and how you had to be perfect. And now the hope of glory lives inside of us. To do this thing where we can actually hear from God be reconciled with Him and then know His will and then walk that will out and bring Him glory. And this is why he links up chapter 3 with chapter 4 and verse 20 through 21. You see that Paul just, he goes off a lot on who God is and how amazing God is. And then he just, just sort of like stops. And he says, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. God could do more than you can ever ask or that you could think according to His power that is in you. You may not think that you're okay and you may not think that you're very powerful and you'd be right. But God could do more than you could think or you can ask or you can imagine. That God could work through us to Him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and forever. To all generations. That would include you and I. And that's going to include our kids and their kids, and so on, forever and ever and ever. Because God is going to rule and reign. And now He's redeemed a people so that He can rule and reign in us and bring Him glory. God works through His church to glorify Himself and works in and through people. So, I'm trying to tell you that God actually wants to use you. And some people need to hear this. Because, well, I know I need to hear this because when there's something that's really hard that, I don't know, is like a problem, like siding on your home where you can't afford and you don't know how to fix it, you don't know who to call, you just tend to ignore things. Have you ever been in a hard situation where you just don't know the answer and you don't know what to do and it's just sort of hard? You just, like, that's my, that's my thing. It's, if it's super, super hard, then I'm just going to just ignore that and just put it away. Just, hey, just... It's great. Life over here. I'm just going to look at life over here. But over here, that little mess, that little problem, that area, I'm just going to, let's just not talk about it. Let's sweep it under the rug. The only problem with that is when it's under the rug, it's still bulging and you trip over it and it still happens, right? So like, here's the deal. Jesus says, hey, I have plans for you. I want to use you. You need to be obedient. If you're not obedient, the only problem is then you're not obedient, like, there's no, like, I'm just going to ignore it or whatever. No, it's like you either obey God or you don't obey God. You, you can't ignore your calling if you're a believer of Jesus because you have the Spirit of God inside of you. You have His Word. He's convicting. He's rebuking. He's correcting. And, 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 and although it's scary, and, and I know for a lot of us, like, those bills that we just never want to face, we just put them away. I know we're in debt, but we're just going to just not ever take care of it. Well, you can as a follower of God because the Bible says you shouldn't be in debt. To no one. 
The only thing you should be in debt is to love people. Or, or you want to you wanna just, oh, well, I know that like Jesus is Lord and I'm going to go to heaven, but with my relationship, no, I'm just going to just put that, that away and just ignore it. Well, no, because the will of God is that you would abstain from sexual immorality. And you have to honor God in that relationship. And you can't just put it aside because it all affects everything. And if you just ignore things, you're really in disobedience. And it damages your life. That sort of stinks, doesn't it? Wouldn't you just rather just on some, like, okay, I love God's word for this and for that, but that area, oh, I just, man, bummer. And Paul now is making a case for us and just saying, hey, I know it hurts, like the truth, but here's the reality. You have a calling. You need to walk worthy in a manner. You can't ignore this. And I think sometimes we've done this in the church, especially. Because here's what, here's what ends up happening with the church. We just sort of ignore our calling and we put it on other people. Because we have an auditorium here and right now there's one guy ministrating a gift of the spirit of teaching and prophetic words and things like that. And we're all listening. So we say, well, that's the pastor's job. Or that's the leadership's job. To do this, 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 and this. But the reality is, the church is so much more than just a Sunday morning, isn't it? Your life, I know, is more than just Sunday morning, right? I hope that God just didn't die for you so that way you could just have two hours of good times in your life or just experience Him only two hours a week. No, God redeemed you so that you would be His people to walk in His will 24-7. And even with our language, we say church, and we say, hey, I'll see you at church. We're saying, well, we'll see you at Sunday morning service. But that the reality is the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches the church are God's people to bring Him glory that have been bought by His price, that are now under lordship and surrender, that we're exalting God and giving Him glory and want to expand His kingdom. And we actually, by ignoring this issue, can actually place a responsibility on the professionals. You know those people, right? The super Christians? Right? Like, you've been walking with God for five years. Of course you should be tithing. Like, but I don't know anything, man. I just gave my life to Jesus yesterday. That's right. Now you're in the game. Now today you've got to decide, are you going to obey or disobey? Today you've got to take responsibility and you've got to grow. You can't just be blaming all these people. And we, we think about that. We think about, oh, well, they're just the leadership team. They're just the pastors. They're just, oh, well, they've been walking with God for 20 years. Hey, man, if you've been walking with God starting today, you want to decide in your heart, Guess what? God's grace is for you. He has a plan for you. He's going to empower you. He's going to give you a spirit. He can do amazing things in your life. That calls for everyone. There are no super Christians, but there are mature Christians and immature Christians. And the Bible says we have to be mature in our minds to actually understand God's word and apply it in our lives. Because, yes, we can hire a pastor. And you know what a pastor is supposed to do? Some work. My role is to lead you, to shepherd you, to lovingly feed you God's Word, which, let me tell you, is not that easy sometimes. But Paul tells us we all have a role to play, and leadership is good, and we value those things. But everyone's a part of it. The role of leadership in the church is actually to equip people to do more work. Paul would go down. If you look at verse, um, verse 11, through 12, God has gifted the church with leadership. And, and He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to, do, uh, to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body. God has given the church, people, offices, roles, leaderships, a position to equip everyone to do this work. This is commonly known. This area is like a five-fold ministry or leadership or gifting. And it is great and it is important and is valuable for you to desire to be an overseer, or to be a leader in the church and to influence people. So I want to go over this for a reason. Before I go back to verse 2 and so on, because I think it's important we address leadership is good. The church, authority, these things are good. They're for our benefit. God sets stuff up. But we can have half of the carpet in God's will and the other half just ignoring and it's still not good for us. We need to make sure that we just don't say, well, no, no, see, Daniel said that's good and then we forget about things. So, God has gifted the church with people to serve the church, to love people, to guard them, to shepherd them, to help them out. This is 
commonly known as fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. And God may be calling you to this. Apostles. This is a delicate, a messenger, one sent forth with orders, a sent one, to establish the gospel in a church. They operate in their gifting and their calling really to kickstart something that is out of nothing. They go into places and preach the gospel and establish churches. Now, some of you may think, well, the apostles, yeah, like Jesus had the 12 disciples, 12 apostles, and he sent them out to go preach the gospel to establish it. Yes, you are great. You would agree with this. You also know that Paul used this language, I am an apostle of God. Paul was the apostle to go into all these places and start churches and fresh works and uh, do these things. However, sometimes we think, well, the apostles were back then. That's not operating anymore. That's false. They're actually apostles today and that apostle gift. For example, if you look back and in the Word of God, they were ministering unto the Lord and then the Lord told Barnabas and Paul, be to be sent, to go and do missionary work, okay? In Acts 14.14, 14, that verse tells us that not only Paul was an apostle, but Barnabas was as well. So there aren't just the 12 apostles. There are more apostles. If you go on, there was another guy in Paul's ministry. He commonly runs into him like, like this way and that way is another guy named Apollos. He would go and plant churches and do work and ministry, and Paul would like, like sow some seeds, and he would water, and he would do this different stuff. Well, in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 9 through 6, it talks about how Apollos was also apostle. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6, um, Paul would typically grab some guys with us, with him, to do work of the ministry, to go and, and serve uh, people like Silas, uh, Timothy, um, these guys. And in, in that verse, it says that they were also apostles. Even in the book of Philippians, Paul refers to Ephroditus, um, as an apostle. Now, why do I bring this up? Because a lot of people think that apostles are dead. They don't exist. They don't operate anymore. But the truth is, we actually call apostles nowadays, in our common vernacular or whatever, we, call them, we would call them missionaries. Sent ones, a messenger of God to establish the gospel in the community of believers, church planners, um, the role of going from Washington State to South Florida, not knowing anyone, to preach the gospel, to establish a community of believers, that's the gift of apostleship. That is something where we would say, oh, that's an apostolic gift. And God gives that gift to the church to grow that church. It's still for today. Movement leaders like John Wesley uh, from Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith, are a lot of people that you've never heard of. Like the funny thing is Paul was an apostle and his whole goal in Acts was try to get to Romans to establish a church, to just do it. And I'm going to go where no one's born, the city and the Mecca. And then it says when he went to Rome, uh, he actually saw the brothers and people that established the church. They were like unnamed. They were just already, they were already Christians there that established a church there. And God needs people in his kingdom to go places where people have never been, to establish a gospel in communities that love him, that serve him. This is an aspect of leadership that is important to the kingdom of God. People are gifted and they're called to just be sent ones, be messengers of God. Along with the apostolic gift, you have prophets. These, these people are also, they're sent by God as a messenger of God, but their goal is to, well, they're one who moved by the Spirit of God, they're a spokesman of God, solemnly declares to men what they've received by inspiration. They operate in this way. They speak forth the mind and heart of God. That you see this not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. When we think about prophecy and the gift of prophecy, we think about future events, but really... Prophecy is one speaking forth of God. God uses prophecy to get to speaking forth something in the future so you would know that he is God. And God still operates in this way as well. In Acts chapter 11, verse 27 and 28, there was a prophet there said. He spoke, spoke forth the future. Even in um, the end of the book of Acts, there is another prophet prophesying that Paul would actually be a prisoner for Jesus. But besides speaking forth the future, they have the heart to speak in a timely manner to edify the body. The, the gift of prophecy really encourages the body, just shakes them up, just really goes down to it and is a prophetic word. These are the guys that are always speaking for scripture in the body of Christ. They just are always just like boom, 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 boom. 
Uh, Acts 15, it says, And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brother with many words. That office, that gift operates today. Even in Acts 13, now they were in the church in Antioch, prophets and teachers. And this is one of the reasons why the Bible tells us to test prophets. Because it assumes you're going to have this operating. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, don't despise prophecies. That, that, that God actually can speak through a man and tell someone, hey, be prepared for this. Hey, you know that issue? This is how God wants to address that. That they can give a timely manner and operate that. That they have that prophetic gift. And God uses that, especially in a leadership team. Um, I've heard stories where people have prayed and there's been people in the gift of prophecy that said, don't, don't do that alone. Go this way. Go that way. In prayer meetings, speaking forth the word of God. And usually it's so calm, it's so loving, it's so full of grace. They just say, hey, you know, blah, 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 and they spit it out. But they'll never contradict God's word. A prophet will never contradict God's word because they speak forth and be, before God. And we know the 1 Corinthians 14 says that God is a God of order. He doesn't, he doesn't you know, get it mixed up like you and I. And so we're to test prophets. In a religious assemblies like us, prophets, well, they're moved by the Holy Spirit to speak, having power to instruct to comfort, to encourage, to rebuke, to convict, and to stimulate our hearts. Almost just like 2 Timothy 3.16, where it says the word of God is to convict, rebuke. You know, these type of things. That's what a prophet operates. Modern-day prophets for us would be like a guy named A.W. Tozer um, 40 years ago. He was just always like, okay, I know the church is doing this, but this is what God's word says. Hey, make sure, get back on track. Uh, a guy named Francis Chan would be like a modern day prophet. Someone that has like sort of a same message, just continually going and parping, just boom, boom. This is what God's heart is. This is, what, this is the message. They have a word from God and they want to share it with people. This, gives, gives, this gift even operates sometimes when I'm preaching and teaching. You may not know that, but you, you ever have that experience where you're like, oh my gosh, did he just, like, did he know that situation? Did he, did he read my journal that morning? What happened? Like, wow, is it? No, I just teach you the Bible, but God operates in these things. Evangelist. This is someone that brings the good news, the gospel. An evangelist has a special gift for communicating the gospel of Jesus in a relevant uh, and powerful way. Now listen, we're all called to do the work of an evangelist and to be witnesses. However, an evangelist win people over for Jesus and actually know how to explain the gospel and the power of why the gospel can affect your life. Okay, so God calls us all to be witnesses of God, but evangelist is someone who knows the doctrines of God and can explain that to people. People like Billy Graham, uh, Greg Laurie, Luis Palau, but they're not all open-air evangelists. See, God has given the body, the church, evangelists, and there are a lot of evangelists that are moms, that are just single guys, that we were hanging out on Wednesday night and... Brian was just sharing the gospel with the guy, doing the work of an evangelist. And so these are people that we see in, in the book of Acts as well, like Philip the evangelist, where he would go into a large assembly and a revival and preach the gospel, but then he would also go to the eunuch, that one-on-one -on -one person. It's like if you have to get the evangelist or this call, it's like you're always talking about God. It's like people, people like they, they open up to the evangelist. Like, I don't know, you're in line, you're talking about, like, I don't know, Oreo fat-free cookies, and you're like, oh, fat-free, by the way, Jesus loves you. And, oh, I'm repenting, this is so great. Like, how do they do that? I don't know. But everything for them is to win people over for Jesus, to explain the gospel, and they communicate the gospel in such a powerful way that people listen. Um, they're concerned always about the lost. These are great people to have in your life if you are not an evangelist. That's why we do ministry together, right? So, like, you know, you may have a hard time to articulate. You may have witnessed to your friend. But you know what? If you have an evangelist there, they'll bring that why and have it answer questions and with power speak forth the gospel. Shepherds, what we know commonly today as pastors, elders, bishops. Okay, they operate for caring and feeding the flock of God. This is their role. John 21, Peter told, or Jesus told Peter, hey, feed my sheep, love my sheep, care for my sheep. They love being around people and are personally love connecting the Word of God to people's lives and counseling. These are great people to go to for advice. They have the role of guarding the flock from wolves. They, they, they jump all over false doctrine. 
uh, some red flags start popping in their, their minds. Oh, you believe this, you believe that, that's wrong, this wrong, that's wrong. These are verse, that verse. Because they want to guard the body of Christ. They want to guard the sheep. They're very concerned with the people of God. And they want the people of God to apply God's word. They create systems so that people of God can be cared for and exercise oversight. And they are led by God's people. They are to lead God's people by his word and just feed him faithfully over, over, over again. You also see teachers. This is sort of self-explanatory, but these were people, one, who teach concerning the things of God and the duties of man. They love explaining the Bible. Using illustrations are their best friends. And they always, um, they just always expound on things and try to, their main concern for you is, do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? Like, I want you to get it. Do you get it? Do you understand? Are you with me? Do you get it? Well, it's sort of like this picture of a mountain, and it goes up high. And this, No, you don't get it? Well, it's sort of like an ocean where, like, it goes like, no, you don't get it? Okay, well, it's sort of like a stack of money. And they just keep on, you're like, okay, man, I get it. You don't get it really in your heart? Tell that to them to get them off your chest, right? Because that's their primary goal is they want to teach you. They want your mind to be renewed. And God has given this, these roles in the church for our good and leadership and a lot of gifts mix, a lot of pastors, a lot of people. You see how uh, God has gifted the church with people to lead. But what I want to bring your attention to is this is only five giftings, five leadership roles, five sort of things. And everyone is not a leader. I'm going to say that again because I think it's very uncommon in the church, especially in the modern-day church. Everyone wants to be this high-end leader. And the reality is the Bible doesn't call all of us to leadership. The Bible calls all of us to be a part of the church. So you can even esteem these things. Oh, man, Billy Graham, and yeah, Francis Chan, and oh, man, like teacher, like Travis, or oh, shepherd, pastor, that's amazing. Oh, man, I just want to start a church. Well, if God hasn't called you to that, you sort of feel unworthy and like, I can't really do anything. I'm not really called. I'm not, I don't have a special place. God has called us to be servants. And there's a vast difference between leadership and servanthood. And so many people want to be leaders because they want their own ambition, they want their own fame, they want to do all this different stuff. Well, God has gifted leaders in the church, but notice why he's gifted certain people to lead, to go forth, to start churches, to speak forth the word, to lead, to win people over to Jesus. Okay? It is so to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. It is for the common good so that we all could know that we're all a part of this. We actually can look at leadership in the church and think, well, they're the roles that, they're the only ones that get to like really do great things for God. And the Bible says it's not true. Paul is saying this is not true. Even in chapter 2, he says this, You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, yeah, you, you have that foundation. You are built on. There is leadership. If, you're, if you have bad leadership, if you have this bad position, then yeah, it's going to fold because Christ himself is being the cornerstone. But he says you're all members of the household of God. There's a foundation, but you build upon that in whom the whole structure being joined together grows in the holy temple of the Lord. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this. If you're a follower of Jesus... If you're a part of God's body, if you're a family, if you're a church, will you take ownership? Because your life affects the body. Your role affects someone else. We don't live in a vacuum, the Bible says. The Bible says that we're all being joined together. Okay, I'm going to do my part, but you need to do your part. And we sometimes esteem other members higher than us, but it's no, we all have a part to play. For example, if you show up, you make a difference. If you don't show up, you make a difference. When you give tithes and offerings, it makes a difference. When you don't give tithes and offerings, it makes a difference. When you are not in God's word and raising your child in a godly fashion, that will make a difference. See, it's not like, well, I'm just going to do my own thing and ignore this. No, we're all making disciples. We're all doing something. It's just, what are you doing? Are you making disciples of yourself? Are you sowing seeds of the flesh? Are you sowing seeds of the spirit? When people really serve, it really makes a difference. Ask some of the moms in here, or the dads, whose children are being washed right now. It makes a difference. 
You may say, well, that's not really that big of a deal. It is. We all have a, a part to play. We all want, God wants all of us to do this, and he wants us to do this in unity. He wants us to actually build something strong, a community of believers that actually does something for his role, for his glory. In verse 2 through 6, it says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called the one hope that belongs to your call. The Lord, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all in all. God wants us all to be working together on mission so that we can make, make an incredible impact in people's lives. So that we can make an incredible impact in people's lives. Right now, I don't know if you know this, but the NBA playoffs are going on right now, and it is awesome. Okay? Right? It's sort of weird. Like it, You don't know who's going to win. Everyone's doing game six, game seven. Last week, I think there were three buzzer beaters because it was like so close and all this different stuff. And it was just because all these nobodies are playing like good teams. All, all the teams that had the superstars, well, they got injured, they got hurt, they're not doing that great, like whatever. But like Atlanta, who really doesn't have that major contract guy, they just have a lot of people doing a lot of stuff, and they're making a huge impact. And God's like, yeah, we don't need to be superstars. We just need to play our part. We just need to know our role. We need to, we need to let God be that person, that coach, that, that, that is doing this thing for us. That teamwork is amazing. And Paul's saying, listen, walk in unity. Walk in a manner that you've been called and quit ignoring it. Take ownership. Do something. Because if you don't do something, you're going to affect someone else. Whether you like it or not. You're a valuable part of the kingdom. I bought you with my blood. I love you. I care for you. I have a plan for you. I want you to do something. But you can't do things together and you can't make as great an impact as you can without the local church. You are called to do something. To do work. And the leadership of the church is to equip you. So I... I urge you, I beg you, walk worthy in a manner of your calling to which you have been called. So you have to ask yourself, well, what, what gifts and role do I play? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, I know that we talk about God and, and He graces us, but in verse 7, it says, but the grace, grace has been given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. See, we all have a role to play, and God has actually given us all a gift. When you became spiritually alive, God gave you spiritual gifts. Something that you can use, that you can bring Him glory, that you can be a part. Now, He gave you a spirit to empower you to do this gift. And this is a supernatural thing. This is something that God wants to use you. You. So we have to ask ourselves, well, if, if, if this is true, what, what is my gift? What is my calling? And see, so many people, because of the way we set up auditorium style, we don't even think about like our plan and our calling. We think, I hope Daniel feeds me this morning. I hope service is good. We don't think about, wow, what if I had that gift of encouragement that I can come to church today and exercise that and give that word to someone so they don't commit suicide this week. God wants to play that role in your life. He wants to be the Lord of your life. He wants to rule and reign. And so I want to give you a brief overview in the last 10 minutes of what these gifts are so you can identify them in your life and so that way you can pray and ask Jesus to start using you. Because remember, we're talking about application now. We want to walk worthy in a manner. We're going to go a little bit more into how we operate these gifts, but just, this is just sort of just, hey, I, just, I believe in you guys. Listen, you should know this. I mean, if you look around, I could say, I mean, I could say that unless you're new today, you're, you've been serving here. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. You've all played a significant role in this church. You were all doing great. Let us understand what the gospel is and what church is and what our role is so that way we can keep on walking and do great things together. This is why we can do amazing events like the Easter egg hunt. But we shouldn't just over-glorify big events. We should be glorifying and, and making sure that God's kingdom is in our everyday life. That when the Spirit of God prompts us to call someone and pray for them, or give them a word of knowledge that we should be able to do that. So what I want to do is just give you a list of what these gifts are. You can study these things for yourself in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, and in Romans chapter 12. But what I want to do is I just want to give you a list. 
These are from these sections, and I just want to explain them so you're aware of them. The gift of knowledge. This is the ability to understand something supernaturally. Many times, it's actually about the Bible, but it's also supernaturally about people and situations. The secrets of their heart, and someone says, hey, you suffer from this. I remember Laura going a few years ago, we went to a church service, and she went up to a lady after service and said, I just need to pray for your, uh, I think it was back or knee, I forget right now. And she said, well, she started crying. She said, wow, I've been suffering for this for eight months or six months. This is the first time I got out of bed because I just was so desperate for God. And now because you said that, I just know that God really knows me personally. Awesome gift. Just revelation in your mind. You know something about someone or situation. There's also the gift of wisdom. The ability to understand God's truth um, applies to a specific practical situation. So knowledge is information, but wisdom is, is saying, okay, um, this is what you do with this information. Listen, if you have this gift, you need to be talking to people in our church and giving them advice. These people are great to go to for counsel. Even look at Daniel where he had the, the information, but God gave him that gift of wisdom to say, okay, now with this information, the famine's coming. You should do this, 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 and this. It was that gift of wisdom. And we should have people in our church that are operating this, this gift to just be able to like listen to people and say, hey, you, know, you, have that, you seem like you're really wise. You have, you have good insight on, on how to apply the scripture to life and stuff. Can, can I get your advice on something? The gift of faith. This is the ability to trust God and envision grand goals that can accomplish through His church. Grand things. Just enormous amount of trust. I believe that I have this gift of just trusting God for big things. Like, sure, I have two young kids. I have no job. I have no, no, nobody there. I just trust God that He's going to tell me to go do that. And I'm going to do it. Sure, I know we don't, have, we don't have very much money and we're a small church, but I just feel God told me to go full time, so I'm just going to do it. It's like, dude, you, that doesn't make any sense. I know. Forgive me, all right? It's the gift of faith. You just trust God. He tells you, you just boom. The gift of healing, the ability to pray or touch lives in such a way that God is able to restore people physically, mentally, and emotionally. Now, although God does not heal everyone, God gives people the gift of healing to actually use. That there are specific people that had this gift and He does heal through these people. And He heals through all of us as we pray together. Right? These gifts are special though. Com coupling with that as a gift of healing is a gift of miracles. The ability to pray in such a way that God produces works that are beyond natural explanation. Remember that, that we serve an amazing God. Remember that Paul would go off and they said, man, they just touched his garment and they, people would just get healed and they would just do incredible things. Don't, don't negate that. That still happens today. Miracles still happen. God works through people to have an enormous amount of faith, to touch God, to know His heart, to do things. And listen, miracles don't happen every day because if they did, then they wouldn't be miracles, right? The purpose of all these gifts is to build up the body and to glorify God. And especially with healing and with miracles, people are like, oh, I don't even know if that happens, or why? how come I don't see that all the time? Well, it does happen, but God, remember, it's impossible to please God without faith. He doesn't just want us to go from miracle to miracle to miracle. He wants us to go from Him to Him to Him. So He manifests Himself in all these different gifts so that we would know Him and seek Him and not just a gift. And because He's so good, He does grant healing. He does grant miracles. He does grant these things of faith. The gift of prophecy. We touched on this as the office, but this is just the ability to speak for God in a way that calls people to faith, repentance, and holiness. Usually people, the people that prophesy a lot, are those people that, that say stuff that's just hard to swallow. Like you know it's true, but it just stinks because you know it's true. Right? Like, oh, no, no, I know I know, I need to hear that. Oh, yeah, he said that Bible verse again. Dang it. Okay, I understand. But these are great people to have to make sure the church is just going along with God and His Word. Same with the gift of teaching, the ability to instruct others in the Word so as to encourage stronger faith, deeper in commitment, and richer growth and maturity in the Lord. The gift of discernment. This is the ability to detect spiritual counterfeits or phoniness. Um, these are great people 
to test prophecies. Because we know that prophecy is a gift. Someone can speak forth. And they can say, thus says the Lord. Well, people with the gift of discernment are great to have because they can detect. It's like a red flag. It's like it's this gut check. I don't know if you've ever experienced this with the Lord, but you just, ah. There's, I can't really say anything bad about that or anything right. There's no really good reason why I would say no to that person. But I'm just going to say no to that person. And then you find out later, oh, wow, I'm so happy. That's the Lord guarding us with the gift of discernment. Uh, usually, my wife has played a, a big role in my life in that. She could discern spirits and things and just like, I, I don't know, well, just watch that person. Well, what, what's going on? What's, what's, what's in their heart? What's going on? Why would you say that? I don't know. Just watch that person. And it turns out we should be watching that person. The gift of tongues and interpreting, interpreting tongues. This is the supernatural ability to speak in another language. And God gives this as a unique prayer language as well. He also gives people the ability to interpret for those who speak in tongues. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit next week. But for right now, we need to understand that a lot of people, especially with gifts, and this is like a controversy, the things of healing, prophecy, um, miracles, and tongues. People think, oh, they're not even here for today, or, or this or that or whatever. Well, here's where we stand as a church. We believe that people today still speak in tongues. Okay? We believe all the gifts. They haven't ceased. We believe that speaking in tongues is not a sign of salvation, nor a sign of being filled with the Spirit of God, because not everyone speaks in tongues. And we also believe it's not a bad thing to desire speaking in tongues or desire any of these gifts to be used by God. 1 Corinthians 14 tells us that we are to actually speak and do these things in an orderly fashion. So you may say, well, I've never heard speaking in tongues before. Well, you may have not. But it's because we do in orderly things. But if you've been a part of a community group or a prayer meeting or a leadership team, um, you may have and you may hear it. I remember even when we were circling around for uh, a leadership team praying. We had a group of people over and I spoke in tongues. And then so we prayed in 1 Corinthians 14, Lord, give us interpretation. And Natalia interpreted. And it was awesome. We were encouraged. We were blessed. And we moved on. But I think sometimes if we put down these supernatural things or things that we don't experience a lot or understand a lot, and I, I think if we do that, we have a tendency to put God in a box. But God uses these things for our good. And let me tell you, it's been a very helpful gift to have as a pastor. When I don't know how to pray for you, I'll go on a walk and I'll speak in tongues and just pray to the Lord and ask God, Lord, just on behalf and just pray for things for you. It's an amazing ability. And so the Bible says that, well, there's gift of tongues, but there's also interpretation of tongues. Some of us, we, we need to sort of sometimes exercise that in praying to God when we're in a prayer circle, because if you never speak in tongues, and someone may have the gift of interpretation, but never be able to exercise their gift as well. Pretty incredible. The gift of helps and service. This is the ability to lend a hand wherever is needed and help in the background. Now, this is probably the most underrated gift of all. But it is, has the most, it's like the most common gift of believers. That people just want to serve, have the heart of Jesus, just exercising behind the scenes. A lot of people have this gift and it is an incredible gift to do. We couldn't get stuff done without these people. People that want to help, people that want to serve. And the Bible addresses that. Like, this gift isn't better than this gift and that gift isn't better than this gift. The gift of leadership and administration. The ability to influence others and the ability to organize and direct. Leaders love the future. They love cast and vision. They love following people, uh, having people follow them. Administrators love getting their systems and managing people, saying, you know what, here's what we're going to do to take it, and this is what we're going to do, and here's a system, and you know, if you did this, this, and this, and they're very detail-oriented. And God uses those people to lead, to get systems done, to get things done. The gift of exhortation or encouragement the ability to motivate people into action, to serve in a holiness in their lives, also known commonly as the gift of encouragement. These are great people to get uh, to just be around. They're really great listeners. Um, they just are always saying kind, nice, encouraging things. Don't you love those people? Like Robbie, he's one of those guys who's like, hey man, I just want to, I want to just brag about the people at Redemption Church, man. This is going right. This is going. Oh, and you should have checked that out. And when people are nice around you, don't you want to be around them? Maybe we should pray for more people like this in our church, right? <laughs> Gift of exhortation, encouragement, just to be able to 
oh, man, we just want to love on people. And just, man, it's a great gift. The gift of giving, contributing, generosity. The ability, our desire to financially support the ministry of God. Let me say this. A lot of people have this gift and they're not rich. A lot of people. They just love giving. They love serving. They love supporting the work of the ministry. They love giving and, and just giving their resources and finances and, and prayer to just expand God's kingdom. Our church wouldn't be actually sustained if it wasn't for these people. There are people that in my life that have the gift of giving that support me all the way from Washington State, our church, just because they want to see God's work here in Delray. Okay? This is an incredible gift. The gift of mercy. A special capacity and ability to visit the sick, the poor, imprisonment, the hurting, the dying. Visibly demonstrating the love and kindness of God to those in need. These, man, these people, they just empathize with people. They're there. They listen. They're great. They have compassion. They're just full of hope. And they're just merciful. People deserve the wrongness and they just give them the right. They just give them love and grace. And Paul would say now, there's a lot of gifts. God wants to do a lot of great stuff. What are you going to do? 1 Corinthians 12 Verse 4 through 7, we'll close with this. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of, spirit, of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Do you know what gifts you've been given? And are you using them for God's glory? Are you walking worthy in a manner that God has called you to? Because when you do this, you benefit not only yourselves, but the entire body of Christ. And we're able to do that through the power and strength of His Spirit. And He wants to use us. He wants to build up His body. He wants His kingdom to come. Don't be discouraged if, if you don't have certain gifts. God has given a gift to you according to His liberty, His grace. And He just wants you to be responsible for you. So what can you do today? How can you see God? How can you ask God? What part would you want to play? How and what does it look like in your life? Let's close in prayer. Jesus, we thank you so much for this time to really just get a shotgun of information, to talk about spiritual gifts and start to think about, well, how does that work? What does that look in my life? Should I ask for this gift and this office? And God, I just thank you so much for your spirit, that, Lord, you ascended and descended, Lord, that you came and put on flesh to die for our sins so that we can have fellowship with your Spirit, God. And, and we, we know that we can't operate in these gifts, not just on a Sunday, but in everyday life, around being the body and building one another up. We pray, Lord, that our body would get these gifts, these offices, these things to encourage us, to build us up. Lord, you give gifts liberally. Give us new gifts as we consider being used by you, as presenting our lives as a living sacrifice to you, Lord. We thank you that we can be empowered by your Spirit to operate in these things. And that... They, they look different in all of us, God. So we're just so grateful that you know us, that you love us, that you care for us. God, may we just continue to walk by faith and not by sight. For we're to walk worthy in that manner. And it's just one step after another, after another, after another. So may we just continue to press on to you. We thank you, Lord, for how good you are. And we ask, God, that you continue to be glorified as we, your people, continue to walk by your grace and be your church here in Delray Beach. We ask this in your name, Lord. Amen.